I always tell the story. I was about six months in, and I was working my job. Everybody there has a job. Um, we can get into the whole prison industrial complex another day, but everyone has a job that you have to work. You get paid 19 cents an hour, and, and these products are shipped out. But when I wasn't working, I was pretty much sleeping. I just was really depressed. And after about six months of being there, one of the guys in the unit with me came in and he banged on my bunk, he slapped on the bunk and said, hey, sis, you can't sleep your time away. Yo, yo, this is too much, slow down. Peace, God, peace. From Music City, Nashville, to the world. This is not a podcast. This is not a conversation about art. This is an attempt to wake you up. And now that I've got your attention, don't listen to the words. Listen to the silence between the words. You are now entering the, the Museum, Museum of, of Presence. Presence. First of all, I just want to start with thank you for sitting down to rap with me. Man, I am. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's good to be here. I was grateful to get this show up and be able to share my my life. So, so yeah, this was this is. Yeah, I think I was telling my might have been my mom. I was saying that if I if I die and someone has to pull something together to say who I was, this is it. Today we sit down with a painter. Omari Booker making amazing strides right here in Nashville, Tennessee. I would say Nashville is grateful to get get you to share this story with us because this is the most moving show I've been to since I came to Nashville. Somehow this story is moving for me in a different kind of way. I think I'm relating to the images that are here at like a very root level somehow. Mm -hmm. And that being said, I really want to just start by talking about this exhibition. We're sitting here in Elephant Gallery right on Buchanan in North Nashville. As I look around, I just wonder, can you describe people hearing this audibly? How would you describe this collection of images that you pull together for this exhibition? The show is called 15, for one thing, and it's about a 15-year prison sentence. I had a 15-year drug possession sentence, which I did three and a half years on and completed the rest on parole. And when I realized that my parole was coming to an end, which I had done 10 years of the sentence on parole, so for a lot of that time, it felt like it would never end. But when I realized that that time was coming to an end, I decided to share that story through artwork. And all the pieces are about that 15 years. And in large part, they're about the people that helped get me through that 15 years. I think that people have responded to the form of the vulnerability, sharing something that was really hard <laughs> to get through and something that also has a stigma of negativity but sharing kind of the, the beauty and the light that came out of it and, and it being here in North Nashville. Okay, this is Shabazz here. I wanted to cut in and give a little bit of context for North Nashville is a kind of historical mecca for black culture and black music. The black recording industry started here on Jefferson Street in Nashville. Rock and roll music was literally born by Little Richard here on Jefferson Street. This is where Jimi Hendrix cut his teeth as a musician. This is where Martin Luther King spoke more at Fisk Auditorium than anywhere else. And so it is important to point out at one point it was such this grand thoroughfare but also as we hear commonly the government placed highway straight through the middle of the heart of Jefferson Street damaging hundreds of businesses that were there that sort of dwindled down the handful of businesses that we find today a little bit of historical context and I'm going to jump right back to Amari I started spending time in this area when I was seven. I was 1987, going to Hadley Park every summer, 
I graduated from Tennessee State University. I worked at Woodcuts Gallery and Framing on Jefferson. So the community that has helped this whole thing be possible is also the community that is over-policed, over-incarcerated, highest incarceration rate in the country. I believe that was in 2015 or 16. So yeah, I think there were a lot of connections that even though they were challenging realities, they made the work have an authenticity that couldn't have really happened just with me. It had to be kind of time, place, people, and, and I was fortunate in some ways to be the vessel and also had to go through the trenches and go through the hard yeah. part of sharing that also. Could you talk a little bit more about the role of the artist to hold that mantle of, of storytelling What's your responsibility to this, if any, mm -hmm. to the embodiment of a story that we're all familiar with on some kind of abstract level, but while you have many abstract images, somehow it's it doesn't feel very, it feels very palpable. 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 Yeah, Thank it's you. right there. It's there. <laughs> you feel it. <laughs> yeah, and I think that. The, the responsibility of of all artists, at least to me, is just honesty with whatever your story is. It's like, because this was my story and it authentically came up for me to express it in artwork, then my main responsibility is to not push that to the side, to, to, to seek making something that might be more marketable or might be more easier to to translate into a gallery setting or whatever. I think it's just the honesty and, and you don't really have to search for that honesty. Like every human is gonna have it. It's like you keep living and there's gonna be something that you need to express fully and honestly. And if you do that, then there really isn't any amount of searching for anything to represent. If you represent your own story as, as, as truthfully as you can, then it all kind of takes care of itself. Mm. So, so, I mean, I think that's, that's what I felt like my responsibility was, was this idea came to express this experience through artwork. And my responsibility was, since it called me into that car, to get in and, and ride that and follow through. Mm. Some of that seems like it might be a responsibility to yourself the biggest one there is. I can deal with what the art world thinks about me. I, I, I gotta live with me. And, and I think it's myself and being of the line that I'm, that I'm from, like being a African-American, Afro-Caribbean, like nothing is really just me. So there is always a responsibility to, one of the pieces is of my grandmother who migrated to the United States in 1967, sent for my mom. My mom came in 1968, the year my mom got to the U.S., Martin Luther King was assassinated, like her and her sister. So while there is a responsibility to being true to myself, part of me being true to me is the stories of this neighborhood, the stories of the people that brought me to where I am, because I don't think, as a person of African descent, I don't think I can run from that reality that I'm not here without a lot, a lot of people really, really, really sacrificing. And so, so, so I think it's both. I mean, I think, I think my, my authentic responsibility to myself does have a communal responsibility that, that is attached. And that's, but, and that's for me, like I don't say that, that everyone doesn't have to, to, to kind of make that their thing, <laughs> but yeah. for me to be true to me, I've also kind of got to be true to that, to, to whatever level feels. It yeah. was real for me. As I look around the room here, I'm seeing lots of these sort of glimpses mm -hmm. of, of a life. It's almost like these moments of time from your time. For sure. There's this sort of biographical feel to this exhibition where you have really taken the, the brave step of what every artist has to take and somehow turn the lens on themselves. Mm -hmm. And you've done that, but I'm just wondering if you could do the pleasure of 
of the people who are listening who aren't able to see the show to just describe one of these paintings. Absolutely. These pieces in particular, there's a self-portrait that's life-size. It's an eight by eight foot self-portrait of me in my cell in about 2012 was when that, that's not when the painting was created, but that's when the memory is from. And I reconstructed my cell using a kind of shoebox diorama so I knew what the light would look like. I knew what the shelf would look like because I already knew what the cell looked like. I had that memorized. I knew what that would look like. But when you're painting or drawing something, it's your, your memory isn't quite enough to get the, the angles right and the scale and all that. I decided to paint it life size so people would have the experience of sitting in my cell with me or of walking into the front door. And that's the hope of, of the show. And part of why when you say to turn the lens on yourself is I want people to have that experience of the same person that they know now and love and trust and would have in their homes and all that is the same person that was in that cell. We have to kind of reevaluate how we look at incarcerated people because I am that community. And so that's what that piece was really was really meant to do. And that's why I felt like I had to make it at that scale. For people who haven't met you in person, you're you're a very large person. You're yeah. a tall person, <laughs> for sure, right? For sure. And and so you have a you anytime you walk into a room, it's like, oh yeah, yo, Mari's here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows when you're here. For sure. And so this painting has this quality of this largeness. It is you could you almost feel how it's almost choking you. Yes. This is sort of claustrophobic in this space, but you but you have somehow found a way to paint this freedom in mm -hmm. the place. I think that one of my favorite pieces is the motif with the bird that's in the window. For sure. And could you talk a little bit about why it was important to include this sort of this sort of bird figure? That yeah, and I think the, the bird, just like kind of everything else in the show, was that that's what was there. Probably from 2011 to 2013 when I got out, this bird would visit my window almost every day, every morning, every day. And there's a poem called This Black Bird that talks about that experience of this bird showing up in my room every day. And this painting was based on that sketch and that visit. This Black Bird. This black bird lands in my window. The same bird every morning. I guess it's the same. All I've seen is its shadow, but it says hello every day, every morning. I fly away with my little black friend every day, every morning. My mind on its back, free on its wings. Though I only see it through bars, we meet at the screen. It visits me every morning, every day. It brings me hope. It feeds my dreams. They're only bars. They're only screens. It's only tears. It's only screams. And to be born, we need these things. It brings me hope. It feeds my dreams. They're only bars. They're only screens. It's only tears. It's only screams. And to be born, we need these things. So for now, I guess I'm free. My little black friend, it visits me every morning, every day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh for sure, for sure. Yeah. They're only bars, they're only screens, it's only tears. It's only screams, and to be born, we need these things. These these words are just so transcendent. They're so moving. And where was this written? That was written at Charles Bass Correctional Complex in 2012. Mm -hmm. That was 
directly having that interaction with the bird, with the, wrote the poem and did the, did the sketch. I think it was that moment that I really realized that freedom wasn't about destination or being home or being able to go eat where I wanted or be with my loved ones. It was freedom was internal. And once I had that, I had it. Finding freedom in the midst of incarceration was a moment that I, I understood that I needed to go through this thing. To be born, we need these things. It's like, we don't, you don't move to the place that you're supposed to be easily. Usually, yeah. It's usually, yeah. It, there's usually some kind of initiation, some kind of challenge and discomfort. And I think at whatever level I was understanding that like, yeah, this is, that's the purpose of this thing. It, uh, it reminds me of the poem from Thich Nhat Hanh, No Mud, No Lotus. Mm. He speaks a lot about how flowers are born from garbage. Mm -hmm. Although flowers soon become garbage again. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then flowers are born from that garbage again. Mm -hmm. I think I just needed to pause with that for a second. Yeah, sure. I want to get back to the painting on the other side of the room. The feeling that I walk away with from this exhibition with how difficult the subject matter is, incredible grief, but also incredible joy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this poem about the bird speaks to that. I think that the, the sort of the, the, the flowers that are, are sort of a re repeating motif that we're finding in all the images here. Mm -hmm. There's an incredible amount of hopefulness maybe. I, mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, but there's something, as much as the grief goes deep, as the, much as the, as the other side of that arise in me and experiencing this, can you talk about how such grief is possible to even form those kind of expressions and feelings. Yeah, I mean, I definitely identify with that. Yeah, and I, and I think the, you, you really kind of can't, you can't really feel true freedom if you haven't felt the absence of it. I mean, if, if there's all just an in-between, everything is kind of fine, then yeah, I mean, the most grateful people that I know <laughs> have been through something that, that kind of really tested them, and that's, and that's most people. Like most people, are, at some point, are gonna are gonna live through something that is that's really challenging. And I think that's what connects in this this exhibit is. I mean, I'm talking about prison for me personally, but that could be that could be an illness for someone. That could be a loss of a parent, a child, a mental health. Like they're, they're, everybody's got their thing. And so I think I, I think it, it it resonates to to know that whatever that thing is it's not forever there is another side and there is that 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 hopeful part of challenging experiences and i mean that's what that other piece is called corrected and the corrected is i mean a little bit of that is kind of poking fun at the correction department of corrections of like because it's, it's a painting called corrected and that's really what i felt like was my corrective force was art it wasn't tdoc it wasn't like prison it was wow. art. i was corrected through art what I'm seeing is an image of you on a couch. It looks like you have a paintbrush in your hand. Mm -hmm. I think it's a window there mm -hmm. with a, a bunch of houses. And uh, there's a coffee mug next to a record with an easel in the background. But the sort of mo most obvious thing about this piece is that it's completely covered with flowers. I do notice that you're, you're wearing your suit. It looks like a kind of a uniform. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm making some assumptions of what that could be about, but I'm wondering if you can help me to get context to beyond what I'm seeing with my eyes and my assumptions. Yeah. Well, the, the, what I'm wearing is coveralls. So I paint in coveralls pretty much all the time. So just short sleeve, cheap Dickies coveralls. So. It also does, it is kind of reminiscent of a prison jumpsuit, which is an ironic, just reality, because it is, it's, it's just the plain cover-up. And in that top right, that window, 
it's actually the units that I was in. So <clears throat> this big self-portrait was taken in unit 10 at Charles Bass in the, at the prison. And so that's unit nine, 10, and 11. So I'm kind of painting in a little piece of the, of the prison into that painting. Yeah, just to tie in how it, how it stays with you. It's like, it's like it's never really gone, even when it's gone. And people have asked me that. They're like, man, what's it feel like to be off parole? And it's like, it doesn't feel like you would think. I'm grateful to, to be on this side of it, but do I feel like instantly free? Not, not more so than I did when I wrote that poem in 2012. <laughs> it's like, I think I'm sure there'll be a gradual re real reality of, I don't have to check in with the parole officer. I don't have to take these drug tests and all the stuff, but, but yeah, the, the lasting effects of, of being in that system are, yeah, the 15 years ain't gonna wear off in a couple of weeks. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what that feels like. And then also the reality of just, being a black male in America, it's like how many black men that have gotten to adulthood really feel free walking around Yeah, the Southern and the South of the United States yeah. or the West or the Northeast for that matter. It's yeah. like, so, so yeah, it's like as, as free as I might feel, we're all in misunderstanding away. Yeah. <laughs> it's really impactful to see these images as a dichotomy, one is an image of you in a cell mm -hmm. and a bird in the window showing you your freedom. Mm -hmm. And another one is an image of you free at your studio or your home. And in the window is this sort of fictitious thing that's not really there, is yeah. this sort of a picture of, of your former incarceration. Mm -hmm. And I feel it's sitting between these two images I feel the tug, the pull back and forth from them and really highlights the difference of having some freedom on paper versus having that freedom in reality. Mm -hmm. I think that this is some of the reason why the story that you're telling is so moving. Mm -hmm. If there is a place that I feel free, it's while I'm painting. Mm. You know what I mean? You can hear Nina Simone talk about slipping into freedom on stage a few times. And if, if there is a place that I really kind of feel that, that's, that's when it is, that's when it shows up. And it, and it keeps me moving towards it. It keeps, me, it keeps me drawn to make an artwork. You're presenting the idea that, you know, freedom is lacking these, these sort of geographical places mm -hmm. and really there's a sort of state of mind, mm -hmm. sort of state of experience or practice. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your process, your practice that allows you to connect with that, that side of you that makes you feel free? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot of it started while I was incarcerated. I mean, I was making artwork before I went in, but I, found artwork as a path to freedom while I was there. And I would under, I started just paying attention to how I felt while I was painting, while I was drawing, especially, or sometimes writing, but especially while I was drawing, how it kind of took me out of the prison. It's like it took, because mentally, spiritually, I was in a, in a different place. And so I think I experienced that enough times in the midst of a place that had such an absence of freedom that when I got home, I knew that that absence of freedom would continue to show up, whether it was in um, a job or a relationship or whatever the thing was, that that, uh, that that feeling was a feeling that I would I would need to be kind of a healthy and whole person, even on the other side of incarceration. And that's what has kept me making artwork and everything else that has kind of come with that has been as great as it's been to be, be able to make art as a living and kind of find certain projects and, and whatnot, that's still like the most important part of it is that it's something that I have to do. And a big part of that is, is, a, is a therapeutic and spiritual path to freedom. And there's 
yeah, there's just kind of no replacement for that. There, there's no, yeah, there, I, I, I just don't, I, I haven't found another thing in, in life that has, that has brought that for me. And it won't necessarily be art for any, for, for everyone, but it'll be something. There's something that, that we can practice that will take us to that other place. Mm. And, uh, and I think often when, when we find that thing, and I'm not saying, or I should say often, often it can be easy to not continue that thing because it doesn't line up with, with the worldly, tangible. It's mm. like it, it doesn't feed you financially a whole lot. It doesn't feed mm. you. But if it's feeding you spiritually, therapeutically, and it's liberating, then all the rest kind of takes care of itself. There's, there's no, yeah, there's really nothing more valuable. Which part of the process brings that for you? The process of painting is definitely, there's definitely a presence with painting and music where you get kind of the right, the right music going and, and get into that, into that flow where you're not as connected to the, to the tangible world. Really meditative. I know for both of us, it's, it's, it's people that kind of practice meditation. There's, mm -hmm. there's a, yeah, there, there's a, there's something that, that's akin to those two, those, yeah. those two spaces. I think it's so interesting that part of the your fa the thing that sort of is most therapeutic for you is just it's just getting the ideas. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason it reminds me of my meditation practice because I in that practice I feel like my job is just to continue to observe mm -hmm. and see what's happening. Hey, take note of the things mm -hmm. this morning. I just realized how angry I was. Mm. Like I, I woke up and I, I had no idea. Oh, so, and there was all these things that I was doing that looked angry, mm -hmm. but I was like, I don't feel angry. Yeah. Until I accepted reality. No, you're angry. There's anger. There's a deep amount of anger here. Mm -hmm. And you have an aversion to even looking at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's almost like a weight off my shoulders and just the acknowledgement. Absolutely. Uh, of that, just yeah. to see, oh wait, there is, I am angry. Yeah. There's this sort of, this idea that won't leave me alone that says the voice that we cannot see, the voice that, that we give no face or give no name or give no attention or note or awareness to is what we become. And I see you giving faces and awareness to a lot of things, which is really beautiful there's also this real sense of community that's here in this in this story as well For sure. and i'm wondering if you could just speak about why it was so important to you to capture so much of the community around you yeah like you said in, in observing observing what's going on if if i observe my life like i just am so aware of how little i would have done without a great community around me and this 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 sentence is a huge example of that there were people that that gave me jobs there were people that picked me up from just just tons and tons of i mean if i start trying to go down the list it's it's i couldn't do it i almost would have to put it in, in, a, in a show because like i couldn't list all of the things that people did to to make sure that i made it through so I think part of it's like a thank you and, mm -hmm. and also just a recognition that when people see anyone who they might deem doing well at whatever craft they're at or that gets through a certain situation like incarceration, then we, we have a, a real tendency to, to, to put the praise and the blame on the individual where it's like, I'm not here because I'm extraordinary. I'm here because there's a ton of people that made sure that I would be here. That's it. Like that's, and so all of the people that aren't here that went back after they got out because they couldn't get a job and couldn't get an apartment and started selling again or whatever, like all of those people are the exact same. It's, it's not that I'm good or that they're bad. I had, I had this group of people. And so, so I think it is important to show the, to show the work to those people specifically and say like, yeah, like you all did it. You know, you're one of those, but you all brought that, that energy and that help and that love, that encouragement. And it's also important to show people that don't know me at all, who, who might say, how do you get from that point 
to that point. And it's like, and for them to look in the mirror and say, oh, it's me. It's like, I'm the person that helps people get from that point to that point. And if, and if we don't do that together, then it never, it never happens. And every, and every successful person that thinks I did it because I'm great, you didn't. You did it because a bunch of people helped you do it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Oof. I mean, I, I, I love this exhibition for, for that reason. The first time that I saw this, we were on the phone yeah. and you, you, you like really kind of went in depth with a lot of these. And it's just every painting has this story of, of the bridge. One, the bridge was built one person at a time that That's helped it. you get over the story of the guy that you work for when you got, what's his name? Randy. Randy. Yeah, Randy Rayburn still owns yeah. Midtown Cafe. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. know. That's... I got the, mm -hmm. when I left the restaurant industry, he gave me this money clip, keep it with me all the time. This one of the restaurant that, he, that I worked at, it was his spot, he gave me that money clip, sent me off to go and be an artist. And so, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's those kind of things. Man. Over and over and over. And then mm -hmm. I'm looking at some notes that was sent to you from your partner. Your girlfriend at the time. She was a girlfriend at the time. Yeah. 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 So I'm seeing notes that she sent to you while you were actually still actually physically incarcerated. Absolutely. Um, yeah. She wrote almost daily. We talked on the phone daily. She visited every week for three and a half years. So it's like yeah. that. Is a, yeah. I mean, that amount of of support and just self-esteem because it's like yeah. you get stripped of a lot of stuff when yeah. you're when you're stripped of everything and you're reduced to that one little box and two shelves or yeah. one shelf because one shelf is yours the other shelf is just Sally's <laughs> so yeah. so so to have people that still see you for who you are is yeah it's hugely important in those in those moments speaking of this another one of my favorite paintings in the exhibition is the one you're with i'm assuming some friends mm -hmm. and you're playing cards mm -hmm. maybe and you guys are laughing and the joy from this painting is so unexpected here yeah right like i'm just not gonna assume this four guys laughing and smiling mm -hmm. in prison yeah and so but there's this camaraderie of of that in that experience I, I was wondering did you just speak about this painting and just speak about the, the feeling there yeah that was the last painting that i made in this show and, and it was really just to share that side of the experience how much that as we talked about the community outside that helps get you through the community inside is hugely important to to get each other through like we we kind of pulled each other through that experience because there was as you look at one of the pieces my grandmother passed the day that I got home, people's family would pass away while they were there. All life keeps on happening. Things would happen with their children. Children would stop being able to visit because of something with the child's parents. Or So the amount of joy that came from each other was so important and it was real. I mean, you would, you would laugh to the point of tears. Some of the just funniest, most, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just like any group of people, no matter what the circumstance, joy exists everywhere. And, and, and I really, really wanted to make sure that that piece was included so people could have that window into, yeah, this is not just a big group of scary people and fighting and whatnot. It's like they're dying, laughing, falling out of their chairs at some joke that somebody, that somebody cracked and just kind of experiencing life together. How has this experience formed your way of finding and cultivating joy in your life? It probably changed what I thought prison would be like. Because, I mean, growing up in, I, I, I grew up in Nashville, but spent a lot of time in North Nashville. I didn't live here, but so. I clearly remember any gathering of a lot of black folk and there's going to be some laughing, there's going to be some joke cracking and you might be the opposite of the joke, <laughs> they might go around you and, but either way they were going to, yeah, and so, so I think I just, it was just an extension of this is just another community of people that is, and, and the jokes are part of it, but it's also the support. I, I always tell the story. 
that was about six months in and I was working my job. Everybody there has a job. Um, we can get into the whole prison industrial complex another day, but everyone has a job that you have to work. You get paid 19 to 50 cents an hour and, and these products are shipped out. But when I wasn't working, I was pretty much sleeping. I just was really depressed. And after about six months of being there, one of the guys in the unit with me came in and he banged on my bunk. He slapped on the bunk and said, hey, six, you can't sleep your time away. <laughs> and I mean, I was, they called me 6'9", because I'm, I'm around 6'9", I'm 6'8", 6'9", somewhere in there. So he said, hey, six, you can't sleep your time away. And it was his, that was his, like, way of urging me to wake up, come out, live life. Like, this is where you live now. Like, you got 15 years. And so if you think you can sleep for three, four, five, or two, however long you got, you can't. So come out and be a part of this community. And, and I did. That was right around when I started drawing and sketching and playing basketball and, and saying, okay, this is, and, and so that's, that was someone seeing a need. He was like, no, man, my brother in there needs to get the fuck up and live. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and he came and, wow. and, and did that. And, and that, that kind of thing happened all the time. There was consistently someone pulling somebody through, like somebody that you go up. When I went up for parole the first time, I got knocked 18 months. So I had the chance to go home and ended up coming back to the unit that same day with the reality that that I wasn't, I didn't make parole. I had to do 18 more months. So you gotta call your partner and call your parents and deal with that reality of like, I might've gotten out, but it's another year and a half. And in that same group of people, they help get you through that. So, so yeah, it's a, a very, like the tough side of prison is a part of it. It's much more like the facade though. It's it's more like, yeah, we all get in there and act tough because there's that there's a that that's a part of the thing. But the reality is it's, it's a bunch of people going through the hardest thing they've ever gone through. And uh, there's 60 year olds that are the that are that are grandparenting the 19 year olds. There's 40 year olds that are yeah, I mean it's 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 true. It is a true community of people, for better or worse. That it's not always fluffy and just pretty and nice. I, mean, I wouldn't paint it as that, but I think to paint it as humanity doesn't exist is, is just false. I gotta pause on that one again. Yeah, yeah for sure. Wake up six. You can't, you, can't sleep your life away. Time away. You can't sleep your time away. <laughs> yeah. Man, that's going to stay with me. Yeah. That's going to stay with me, this, this picture that you're here, even walking and walking down the street, and I don't want to be here. This is a thing of that mindfulness has helped me to do, is mm -hmm. to stop time traveling. Yeah. Like, I, I want to be in the part where I'm done with this. Yeah. Right? I'm raising two boys. And when they were babies in their diapers, only thing I wanted them to do is get out of their diapers. Mm -hmm. And then when they were out of their diapers, the only thing I wanted them to do was walk. Mm -hmm. But then after that, I only thing I wanted them was eat. And then I wanted them to talk. And then I wanted them to get to school. And then I wanted, and one day I look up and my kids are growing mustache hairs mm -hmm. and I didn't even see it. Yeah. They're, they're growing, they are, they, I, I was so fast forward in so many things a lot. I miss a lot of the moments. For sure. And, and there is this, and that's not just with, with raising kids, but there's also with work. I want to get through this thing so I can get to the other thing. And, and I want to climb this thing so I can get to that thing. It's like, we're never allowed to be where we are. Yeah. And, and that's the only place we can be. And, and that's the only, <laughs> yeah. that's the only reality that exists. Yeah. The, the, you know, like the, the past and the future, these sort of fantasies where our present moment is expansive, is, is gigantic, and all the joy that we ever wanted is possible here mm -hmm. if we give it permission, mm -hmm. which is not the thing that I thought that I'd get from this show. Yeah, for sure. But it's exactly the thing that I get from this show. And I love that. I love that. Yeah, time. So many people talk about doing time. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the 15 year sentence, a big thought of that was, I think the, 
the blessing of a sentence that at least for my age was pretty long was that when I got the sentence it was 14 15 years from that time so like I stopped thinking about the future because it was truly invisible it's like I can't fathom being 42 when I'm 28 because that's when I, I got arrested when I was 28 and went in at 29 now I'm 42 getting off parole but until about 38 37 42 seemed way far away and so so yeah I think that is kind of a uh, a strange blessing of so of, of, of a period of time that's longer than you can fathom so kind of all you have is that that day and and even while you're in it's truly one day at a time because anything else is you're just torturing yourself people talk about that all the time when they're in like if you spend your time thinking about what you were before you went in or what you will be when you get out, your time's gonna be real hard. Because we all were something before we went in. We're all gonna be something when we get out. But that's not what's going on right now. Right now, we, we, let's, we gotta bust up these ramen noodles and play some spades and hope there's a game on tonight. That's, that is what it is today. So I don't care if you're a kingpin in South Nashville before you, I don't care if you're gonna, that's not what it is right now. And, and I think everybody gets reduced to to moments. And it can be really challenging. It also can be really, really beautiful in a lot of ways. Uh, Omari, this has been a really, really, really great conversation. And I think that we need to end it on that note because hey, that's it. very powerful. This was such a great conversation with Omari. And if you want to find out more about the work that he's doing, if you want to see this exhibition, you can holler at him at omaribooker.com, check out his Instagram, or come to the Museum of Presence. I'm really inspired by this session, and I hope that you are too so until next time my name is shabazz larkin and this is the museum of presence peace they're only bars they're only screens it's only tears it's only screens and to be born we need these things it brings me hope it feeds my dreams. They're only bars. They're only screens. It's only tears. It's only screens. And to be born, we need these things. <laughs>